Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Yim from WQXR in New York City, and we are very sad, of course, not to be in Detroit together, enjoying each other's company, having a drink at the bar, hearing great music live, but we are still delighted to be here with you this afternoon to talk about a really interesting topic. Um, our friends at Sphinx have provocatively titled this Artist Collectives of Tomorrow or Cover Bands of Yesteryear. And here to help me unpack that very powerful sentence and talk about innovation, collaboration, and the future of orchestras are my uh, colleagues and uh, fellow panelists, Marlon Daniel, who is a wonderful conductor and is the founder and artistic and music director of the Festival International de Musique de Saint-Georges. He is also music director of Ensemble du Monde, and he is associate director of Florida Grand Opera. We also have Lady Jess, kick-ass violinist and artistic director and concertmaster of the Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra here in New York. And we have my friend and wonderful colleague, Gary Padmore, the director of education and community engagement at the New York Philharmonic. Hi, y'all. Nice to see you. Hi. Hello. Hello. We're going to break this up into a couple of sections. Um, we're going to start by talking about the what. What is innovation? What? How do we measure innovation? What do we mean by innovation? And my friends are going to bring some real life examples from their lived experiences about that. And then we will pause and take questions from all of you. So as questions occur, drop them into the comments section and we will break in the middle uh, for about 10 minutes of Q&A. And then we will go on to part two, which is the how. Um, how do you translate vision into um, collective action? How do you align an organization? Um, how do you um, inject innovation into perhaps more legacy cultural and music organizations that have a tradition as well as a desire to innovate? So we'll talk about the what first and then the how. So friends, I want to start by asking a very broad question, but since we talked about this a little bit before, I feel like it's not terribly unfair. How are we talking about innovation in this session? Um, what are some things that come to mind in terms of how we're gonna scope innovation for the purpose of this conversation? Um, Marlon, do you wanna go first? Wow, um, well, thank you, um, Ed. Well, I think innovation has many, many facets in many ways. Uh, one of them is programming and repertoire. And another one is a key element, I think is actually personnel. You know, those, these two things work together are very, very powerful. Um, the 21st century has uh, shown us, you know, with organizations like Sphinx and things like that, that um, people of color and, uh, you know, people of the African-American and Latinx communities um, actually are qualified and um, uh, classical musicians. We can do all the things that any other group of people can do just as well. And we can actually do it on the same stages, provided that there is an opportunity. Um, we cannot grow without opportunity. And so that's one of the main things, I think, two elements that I think that are very necessary to this new innovation. Um, once we get there, you know, a lot of, um, of course, orchestras and uh, in most, I only talked about the United States because we seem to always like something that's brighter and shinier from across the sea somewhere instead of things that are right homegrown here that are very innovative. Um, and even in like places like, of course, our um, compatriots in Canada, they have things set up where they're using musicians and compositions that are by their compatriots first. Um, they are not seeking to go, and, and I love Ligeti and all of these composers who are wonderful, but first of all, when they give out money and things like that and opportunities, they're giving them to composers that are coming directly from their country. And mm -hmm. that's, and our country is very diverse. And we have like uh, composers who are of Latinx and of course, black communities that are starving to have their works done and being bumped. And I think that this is one of the things that we have to be, we not to say instead of, but in addition to our, our tapestry. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Was that some of the uh, thinking behind founding uh, your festival dedicated to Chevalier Saint Georges in Guadeloupe, Marlon? Well, no, not at all. Um, it uh, Chevalier de Saint Georges is, of course, a diverse composer, uh, probably the first uh, composer of African descent that we know of, well, that I know of. And um, but it came uh, because in the festival is considered perhaps a, you know a shining light of diversity in the world. I'm like it wasn't very difficult. Only thing I had to do is be there myself and call several of my friends, and we were already diverse. Uh, we didn't go after it as a sense of like we're going to make this big diversity statement. We just called people who could do the job, who you were familiar with, and it was automatically diverse. We're not mm -hmm. a black festival. We're not a diverse festival in that sense because we have, uh, you know, like the the principal oboist from La Scala plays with us. Mm -hmm. uh, the principal flute player from the um, Iceland Philharmonic plays with us. But all of us mixed together, combined with, you know, like Janae Bridges and people like that, we become a diverse festival simply from the fact of that we hire diverse people who are part of our musical tapestry. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It's like you started with the premise of a diverse group of collaborators and artists and um, administrators to begin with, and, and then everything organically flew, grew out of that, it seems like. Well, for sure. I mean, you're yeah. not excluding people, you're including people. Yeah. Yeah. Lady Jess, uh, or Jess as we call you, um, tell us a little bit about Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra and how it and you define innovation. Um, in that con you know in that organization but also you know you have such an amazingly genre free career as an artist and as a as a leader um i want to i want you to touch a little bit about that how do you define innovation for yourself and for the organizations that you belong to yeah um i like the question because i can clearly kind of split it up into two um, with urban playground which was actually the vision of tom cunningham who is my partner um, and who took the leap and made, took a risk on me and said, listen, I know we're co-artistic directors, but I believe in your vision and I think you just need to do this. So will you be artistic director? Will you have a creative voice um, at the highest level? And so in that sense, I think it was innovative of him to make that choice, um, to take that risk and it only really complements the mission of the organization, which is based in a sense of collaboration and the prioritization of black and women composers. Um, and so for me, that being my first executive leadership role, it was a perfect fit. It's not a large, we're not a large orchestra. Um, we're a small organization, but between the visionary board that we have, which is also very diverse socioeconomically, um, I feel extremely supported, uh, supported creatively in programming um, and who we hire. I just had a call with, the organ uh, with Tom yesterday about a new composer that I just met while performing something with Carrie Mae Williams. Like, all these cross connections that I was already navigating and cultivating in my own freelance life, suddenly I can apply to an organization. So it's more than just me affecting change. And so in that way, I feel like I become in service to the innovation itself in that role. Mm -hmm. I already feel that that role is in service to the score. It's in service to the organization, in service to the greater mission, but just in that way specifically, I feel really empowered um, in that direction. And then in my personal practice, um, I've had to be the innovator to earn the check. And that unique positioning between having to think creatively and also administratively and also fiscally has kind of, I think, really opened my eyes to what's possible. Um, when we talk about innovation within ensembles, innovation within organizations, um, within the academic structures that already exist that we can't ignore. Um, 
so yeah, from my personal perspective and from the organization, I think those, those two things really kind of work in harmony with each other. Awesome. So what I'm hearing both from you, Jess, and from what Marlon said is, you know, it, innovation as we are kind of scoping it for this conversation is really about what we play. It's also about who plays it. It's also about who gets to decide, right? Yeah. It's it's kind of those three levels of things, right? To so we're we're going to try to focus on those things. Um, Gary, um, you work. You are a one of the most, uh, you know. Uh, senior black orchestra managers in the country and you are also at one of the most storied and uh you know the oldest orchestra in the country at the new york philharmonic how do you think about innovation within the work that you do at the new york philharmonic and you know prior to being at the new york philharmonic yeah thank you for that question and and you know an honor to be on this panel um i think for me specifically i, I really approach um just innovation with a lot of questions um you know, especially because for me personally, I didn't necessarily come into this field or to this art form um, in the most, I guess, uh, formulaic way. You know, I, I sort of came in in a, in a way that was sort of kind of dropped into it in many ways. And so um, when I think about programming and I think about who's on stage and what's being programmed, I also think about who's in the space um, taking part in that programming experience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think about the folks who are on my block, you know, where I grew up. I think about my parents. I think about my kids. You know, I think about, you know, basically anyone who, who should be, in, you know, um, able to engage in that process. And so um, for me, it kind of takes different forms depending on, you know, what uh, resources I have available, which I think is, is also important to consider. Um, and so in recent history, it's taken, it's taken shape in different ways. Um, actually, a couple of years back when when you were asking the question to Marlon, I thought about, you know, when I was first learning about Saint George and and how he became the resource for me and how we were sort of crafting programming at Orchestra of St. Luke's and then eventually, you know, moving into Florence Price and kind of, you know, exploring her work and and you know being a part of that process, which which ended up leading, you know, to to the work being published, et cetera. Um, at the Philharmonic, there are a few different things we've done in the last uh, few months, which I, I offer it only as a sort of an example, not to say what you should do, but really, you know, to, for people to kind of see and, and say it either works or it doesn't work for them. But um, one program in particular um, that we explored uh, last year was called Bandwagon, which was in partnership with um, Anthony Roth Costanzo. And I think that program was actually quite uh, innovative because it really um, shifted our thinking from how to bring people into the hall to how do we actually bring the orchestra out into the our broader community and so that was like the first you know simplest way of looking at programming um and so that was the first iteration the second iteration was really thinking about how do we sh we should actually ask the community whether they want us to be there in the first place and so um so then we started having conversations with partner organizations and and through that and through, through those experiences i think it, it actually you know, resulted in, yes, our Philharmonic players performing on stage in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, you know, in Queens, et cetera. But it also allowed us to actually be on the same stage with incredible artists from these various communities. And so um, what we were doing was actually sort of breaking down the hierarchy that exists, you know, um, as it relates to, to our field and other art forms and other individuals, kind of similar to what Marlon was saying earlier. So that was, that's one program. And then most recently, we had a young people's concert um, that you know we, we hadn't performed in about two years, and I was grateful that we were able to come back because we um, were able to feature the Harlem Quartet. Um, we had an MC on stage. We had, um, I think, all all but one composer in that program was a living composer, including you know two young people. And so I think for us, innovation actually. Um, again, like reflects like, you know, who we are as a people, you know, who, where we are in society. And so, and the more we can, you know, grow and, and do that work um, in an authentic way, I think is, is um, that's that's when you actually see the results, um, whether it be a concert or or even a talk. One, one last thing I'll just quickly share is um, an initiative that we just started called Unanswered Questions, which is looking at the content that we have on stage with the Philharmonic and putting it into a, a much uh, sort of broader social context. And so, for example, um, a few months back, we had a discussion with Anthony Davis around his piece, You Have the Right to Remain Silent. Um, soon after, we had 
a discussion about Handel and his um, ties to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, just yesterday, we had a discussion around Julius Eastman and you know his work, his legacy, and also his um, challenges around mental health and homelessness. And so again, what we're thinking about is how do we engage in conversations? How do we participate and invite people to participate in rich artistic experiences? And how do we grow and, and, and um, expand that work? Um, we are going to start taking questions from our uh, listeners in a little bit, but I, I want to touch on this idea of authentic authenticity, Gary, that you that you spoke about. And one of the things that the that the four of us talked a little bit about what makes something truly authentic is not only the thing that you said about like asking communities, like, do you want us to be there, and not just assuming, right? Um, but building those relationships. But then, how do those relationships? come back and change the Philharmonic, do you think? It's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think I think um, it happens when everyone is at the table. You know, I think I think um, we can't I can't as an administrator um, assume that by me doing this work that everyone should just get it and that it you know it'll like we'll all learn the lessons and we'll do it differently tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I'm learning actually at this point that everyone from our musicians, the staff to the community members need to be a part of the process. And I think the process is going to be key, um, a, a key ingredient to how, you know, we actually see transformation. Um, and I think, you know, also having the, the openness and vulnerability to actually be willing to make, um, to make mistakes. Because I think, you know, quite often, especially with the Philharmonic and other big institutions, you know, the, 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 the hope is that we can go out and do everything well, but I think understanding that this is a messy process, it actually frees us up to kind of, you know, be more bold and adventurous with what we're doing. And I think, you know, that's when transformation happens, when we're kind of like getting messy, um, getting honest, um, and, and also reflecting on our work. And, and, and hopefully when we can do that um, over time, you know, we'll see progress, um, you know, happening. Um, and, and also accountability, I think is key. To that equation as well, I'll just just add. Yeah, I love what you're saying, Gary, about risk taking and not feeling the need to be perfect by whoever's definition being a path for innovation. And I'm wondering, Jess and Marlon, if you can think of a time in your personal life or in your organizational roles, like where you've done something and you were just like, okay, this isn't going to be like exactly, you know perfect in the way that we thought it, but it's still like, we're going to push ahead because we're not going to get anywhere unless we do the thing, right? Yeah. Any stories? Well, Gary, you know, I, I really liked what you have to, to say and how bringing it to the community and them being exposed and things like that. But, you know, that's how dreams start. You know, um, I, of course, worked with Columbia University and um, Dr. Janice Robinson there um, at the uh, Teachers College. And we did a program called Diversity and Classical Music Project, where we went into the schools that they they actually support. And um, we did a whole big thing on before there was Mozart, with, which is a lecture on San George and Mozart and everybody else afterwards and people and composers of color. And um, and I got to work with the kids, you know, in different levels of them, conduct them at the end give the lecture and afterwards, you know, this little girl, because we had not only music kids, but just kids in general. And it was inspirational to these kids. And I know that because one of the little girls came up to me afterwards and she says, I never knew there was a such thing as a black conductor. And now that I've seen you, I feel like I can do anything. And it's a way that music is transformative in many ways. And it's not just about music. It's about, you know, the arts in general, how they transform lives. And music is a exemplary catalyst for how it does that, no matter what field you, and it crosses that. And having this, you know, a bandwagon or something like that, you do not know who it's going to touch or who it's, mm -hmm. going, to, like it's going to affect. Um, and, and I don't know, this girl could be, who knows the next big donor. She could be the next Bill Gates. She could be anyone that keeps our art alive and keeps inspiring the next generation. Yeah, so true, Marlon, absolutely. And we have to keep in mind um, that we are trying to move people and, and, and touch them. 
um, and we have to reach a lot of people so that we can, you know, touch as many people as possible and see where those bright spots are. But um, I want to kind of come back to the question of risk taking and of being free to make mistakes and not be perfect, you know, and and how that has played a role in our lives and work. Jess, do you have anything in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I, I find the question interesting because my positioning, I often feel that I don't have room mm -hmm. to make mistakes. Yeah. I have room mm -hmm. to take the risks because to be an American is to take risks, mm -hmm. but I don't have room to make mistakes as a black and woman. And why is that as a black woman? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel, I don't feel, I, I don't feel based on my experience that I've had mm -hmm. the room to make the mistakes. I do feel like I've created the room to for myself to take the risks um but in my lived in experience so much of of that is contingent on the powers that be and whoever yeah. is running things in the room at any given time and i find that um there's a big or i should say there's a very thin line between you know leaping into the beyond and taking the risk and also being realistic about what happens if you fail. And I find that that comes into my professional life all the time in the form of, well, I have to do this right because all around me, I see men getting away <laughs> with doing, mm -hmm. like taking these leaps and just going, well, I was intrepid, so I'm just going to hire. And if it, you know, it's just like, I, I don't know that life to be honest. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, but at the same time, I think it's good that the question is asked because I don't think that people consider enough the fact that right now you're seeing more and more women in positions of power and in positions of choice and moving things forward. At the same time, those women are where they are because they've been as careful as they've had to be to move mm. forward and to be heard in the same way as the person next to me, who's just like, well, I'm out here and my my crazy idea is is crazy, but it's also like Instagrammable and it's also revolutionary. And so, you know, it's so much of it, I think does come down to um, vocabulary and experience. And so, yeah, just to answer honestly, like I think that my experience is important because it is the, the different experience in this dialogue, but I haven't found it to be the case necessarily. And that also, is really powerful. Yeah. And also part of that is understanding and being able to compartmentalize how much of that is conditionings that I have to deprogram myself from and how much of it is what is actually in place. And I think understanding where those differences lie are really crucial to keeping the dialogue around innovation productive and efficient. Mm. Wow, yeah. I, I find that very true, and especially for people of color. Yeah. You know, you always are grown up to, um, you have to be 10 times as better, and you have to do all these things, but you only get one shot. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know as RuPaul would say, don't F it up. You know, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, uh, it, and, and it follows you, you know, yeah. you make, I make a mistake in, uh, in 2000 and it's that guy who made that mistake. Whereas other people get thousands of chances, like, um, you know, a, a prominent opera star, they forget the lines, walk on the stage, wrong you. I was at a concert there yet they're still working. If you were a person of color, you would never, ever work again. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's why you have to really, really be careful in all this plotting and things like that. So you can set yourself up for a success, which is everyone tries to do that, but you know, but also not set yourself up for failure because a failure would be ultimately career destroying. Innovation yeah. is chess, it's a chess game. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm really getting from this, which I think is extremely powerful and, you know, I haven't quite thought of it in this way, is if we want to be innovative and if we want to elevate diverse leadership and voices, 
how do we create space where it's okay to fail? Where how do we create space where it's where failure is not a failure, but it is a step towards something else, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't have an answer for that, but I think it honestly, like I'm getting a little shivery right now because I'm just thinking like, how do how do we create organizations to where, you know, okay, we might fail and that's okay. And we're gonna give space and room and support for that to happen if it's in pursuit of something, you know? I mean, and just to jump in really quick, these organizations are failing all the time is the other mm -hmm. side. Hello, yeah. In an yeah. optics way. I mean, right. they feel like, what? I, if you could see just like DMs between me and my friends, like just like major organizations doing something on social media or like major organizations that I grew up with that I know intimately that I used to be a part of never being able to take to type Black Lives Matter, but posting image after image after image of black children with instruments out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, it's like they fail all the time. And I think it's also a difficult question because what is accountability? Like, what is a way that you can answer to that and really learn from that? And also, like, I think it's a I think it's a valuation game. It's like how much do I value you having a safe space to fail or do I value for me? I can only speak for me. It's do I value you having a safe space to fail more than I value you a missed opportunity? Like the mm -hmm. the weight of a missed opportunity. And in my life as a child who grew up the product of many of these same nonprofit programs, the weight of you and the missed opportunity will always outweigh my concern for you having a safe space to fail. And mm -hmm. that reality is the reality of the younger generation. In my experience, they don't have the patience for you to fail. And yeah. it's like, that has to, I think that there also has to be room for that in the dialogue as well. Yeah. But wow. I think many of these, these organizations, you know, they love the advantages of being diverse when it benefits their budgets. Hmm. You know, we, we're, you know, I've uh, seen the program and I, I'm, I think I know which program you're talking about, Lady Jess, where, you know, it was a program for kind of Black Lives Matter jumping on the boat and not a single Black performer on the program. Mm. And, uh, and, but they, yet they're, you know, they were cel celebrating this and I'm like, well, in your whole institution, you didn't have anybody, not one person. Um, but, you know, in these groups and they're being rewarded by, you know, a group that is, for instance, uh, not a very diverse group is being rewarded by getting money from foundations to become more diverse when there are diverse groups already out here who cannot get the same support or funding. Well, it's a known fact that if you look at the philanthropic landscape that BIPOC led uh, organizations get even accounting for budget sides mm -hmm. are get far, far less than, uh, than the big legacy white led organizations for sure. And, you know, I see movement in, yeah. uh, especially from, you know, real leaders like Elizabeth Alexander at Mellon and, uh, Darren Ford at Ford found, uh, Darren Walker at Ford foundation of not just giving money to organizations that are going to do the thing, mm -hmm. but giving organization, favoring organizations who are going to do the thing with diverse leadership, which are two different things, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a question that came in that actually speaks to something, um, Gary, that we talked about in our prep session. Someone says, um, I heard if you see something called innovative in Time Magazine, it's actually 15 to 20 years old. <laughs> if time is a big institution, what does this mean for how small and organizations, small and large organizations work together, right? So that, it, it, it you know, I, I was just in a conversation actually with a foundation person who said, I just want to be really sure that you're careful about how you frame this question to the organizations that you, WQXR, are partnering with, because there's a lot of suspicion and there's a lot of skepticism of partnering with large legacy organizations from this part of the ecosystem. They feel taken advantage of, they take, you know, they feel used, they feel, you know, all the things, right? And so I think that question of reciprocity and true 
partnership is something that we need to talk about. But also what this question brings up is the thing that we talked about is like, who do we allow to tell us whether we're being innovative or not? And Gary, you, ha you had a really great thought on that that I was wondering if you would share now. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think the um, <clears throat> the challenge that we were faced with uh, in this field, I mean, it's, or in this system that we're in, in this world, um, is I think while we recognize um, the need for diverse voices, leadership, et cetera, we're still pretty much reliant on you know predominantly white institutions to tell us like how and what we are you know and the ways in which we're valued. And you know, like for example, like I work at the Philharmonic, yes, but the Philharmonic doesn't define me. I'm a black man, you know, from Brooklyn, family from the Caribbean, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think, I think the, I think, I, I look at, you know, this is a part of my journey. And I think in this field, you know, when we sort of remove the sort of crown and and actually look at all, us all sort of equal. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's, without being said, the Philharmonic is a big institution. We represent, you know. Um, we take up a lot of cultural space, um, but I do think if there is a way for us, for our field, for individuals to sort of like, you know, kind of remove the mindset that the Philharmonic is like the end point, but that we're a part of a journey or a part of a larger yeah. ecosystem, or, or the New York Times for, you know, a review, which yes, I'm not saying that that it wouldn't be great if we had a review from the Times to come, et cetera, but why not Amsterdam News? Why not some, you know, somewhere else or, or another, you know, why not the source? You know, I mean, I just feel like we have to think differently about, um, you know, who who adds value. And, and, and I think when that starts to happen, um, at least in my mind, for me personally, I have nothing to lose because I'm not looking for validation from, from spaces that, that for, you know, centuries have not necessarily valued me as a person. So I, I that's sort of how I, how I view it and would hope that others could sort of look at it in the same way. Yeah. Jess and Marlon, where do you look for for um, feedback or constructive criticism or validation, um, if not to the you know to the white centered you know legacy publications and commentators that we have in our system? Like, where do you look for uh, you know? Is it a close circle of friends and advisors? Is it your colleagues that you work with? Is it you know? Do you it, it, you know, like where can we look for that support aside from the way places that we've always, as classical music orchestra people, have always looked for that validation? Any thoughts? I try, I was going to say, I try not to, in the sense of that, um, you know, at this point in time, and at least in my career, you have a bunch of people and, and they, they can be, they're diverse or not who we have proven already. Uh, that you as a person or a musician or a growing musician have some value and that they want to support. They're not just coming along because, you know, you're doing doing that because, you know, there's plenty of auditions. You go on and you send tapes and resumes and you figure out and you look at the um, track record of who, at the end of the day, who they've actually selected to do whatever they have. And they send you a letter and says, oh, you're not what we're looking for. Well, from your description, I'm everything you're looking for, and then some. Mm -hmm. So how do you come up with these people? <laughs> you know, what do they all have in common? And that's, you know, and so you try to not to, you know, be discouraged, because if you look for uh, some kind of, um, some kind of, some kind of, some kind of, um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that you're looking for some kind of people to, uh, give you permission to do something, you won't get that. Mm -hmm. You will not get that. You have to find it in yourself and believe in what you're doing. And hopefully, no matter who they are, you know, either white or black, that they see the value in what you're doing and support it. You know, as I mentioned before, like, you know, a lot of the things people, the organizations get money to make diversity in their organization. I would like to see more, more sort of like a little bit of a reverse that they are doing diverse things already without mm -hmm. the support of like a check or something looming over them to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, or maybe maybe you should have the smaller organizations that are the ones they gave the money to, and then they get to pick the organization that they want to help support them instead of the opposite way around. Oh, I love that. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. That's great. 
Um, um, yeah, Jess. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'll be, I'll be fast. I, I think, you know, I'd like to use, I look for affirmation more than I look for validation. Um, and I look for affirmation from very close advisors that I trust and just the filter of like, can I trust you in this industry is a powerful enough one for me to know, you know, can I look to you for advice? I can send them a recording and be like, tell me like, is this trash? Is this what? Like I can send it to people, you know, I can send things that I write, I can send letters, I can, you know, asks, all of that. As long as I have that, um, I guess if I can get affirmation from people that I trust, then I feel like I am empowered enough to validate what I'm doing. Because a big part of the process of being a creative, I think of being an administrator, being anybody in a position of choice, is trusting that your vision will work or trusting that there's a place for your vision. Because I do think a big part of innovation, even as an individual, is, is understanding your lane and where what you're doing fits in the greater evolution of things. Mm -hmm. um, it is not so black and white as like, if you do this, then this won't work. Or if you do this, then this won't work. Um, yeah. The whole premise is that we're nuanced people. And so there has to be a place for those nuances and there is a place for all of those things within this like wider umbrella. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to move on to talk, I mean, we've touched on it a little bit so far, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the how um, of instilling authentic innovation in building diverse voices in decision-making, in, um, in, in, in creating a path for risk and, and constructive failure uh, in large institutions and all of that, right? So one of the things um, that, that I struggle with sometimes is that, you know, I was kind of raised in a very hierarchical system of working for these big orchestras. And, um, you know, the singularity of a, of a clear vision from a person, usually a white man, uh, was, you know, I was kind of taught for a long time that, you know, if everyone gets in on the act, then, you know, the vision gets kind of lowered to the, you know, to a common denominator instead of being a strong, clear individual vision. Each of you has responsibility in your organizations for providing some vision. How do you balance that with bringing in a collective of voices and artists and diverse artists and voices into into the leadership of an organization, like how owns those two things? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, if that's okay, I yeah, I think I, I know one of the most th exciting things about stepping into the position as artistic director was the chance, and the fact that we are so small was the chance to really um, approach it from a performer based priority place like we prioritize our performers and we prioritize collaboration because there's no point in collaboration if your performers feel undervalued or if they're treating it like just another pickup gig which is its own subculture in new york city um and so that was one of my favorite things um was just kind of restructuring how we approach things like i want to know who you are as part of why we hire you. And it's part of how I, like my experience as a contractor, that's how that will come in because I can program the actual program. I can write the program notes, but then I also know these people. And so I know who will be most moved by what particular program. And I also know who will bring in a specific audience that will work for this program, you know, whose students are of this demographic who will appreciate this program because I'm working with freelancers who are also educators. And I never, I always wanted that to be a priority as opposed to something that got in the way of someone scheduling, you know, as a performing string player in New York City. Um, so in those ways, like, are you a parent? Is it better for me to program you on this program or this program because your kid is in school at this time? 
are you pregnant? Is it better for me to program you now so that you're not, you know, so that you get the chance to perform so that you'll be excited about it. It's all of those things that I think um, subconsciously approaching it this way, that is something that will reach every single person that we ask and that hopefully they will take into the greater, like the wider music community. And so, yeah, for, for me, that's that, that I like that because that's a big, that's a big priority. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I Gary, think, um, Gary, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I think a lot about who, who my community is, like, you know, and where, you know, we're doing this work. And, and also kind of similar to something that Marlon was saying, you know, I'm also thinking about where my, like, how I'm using the money that I have to actually support the work that I want to do or that should be prioritized. Because, you know, I think um, if it's sort of seen that I'm doing like all the other things and then at the, at the very end, the things that are innovative or that are, you know, more community censored, like have 10% of my thinking and, and my money, then, then it's impossible to actually have anything that's meaningful or impactful. So, um, so like, you know, recently with the works that I had mentioned at the top, you know, everything that I'm, that I'm doing, I'm starting with that work because I feel strongly that that work is what needs to, to happen. And, and I'll find ways of doing other things. Um, but I think beyond that, I do feel like I understand that working at the Philharmonic, you know, affords me a certain privilege. And so when I'm going to partners, I'm also recognizing that they, that they need to be paid for their work and for their time and for their energy, you know? And so it's not just, you know, me trying to exploit who they are, you know, their identity, their community, but actually thinking, well, how do I actually ensure that that your time is actually worthwhile because, you know, um, because you should be paid for the work that you're doing. I think quite often, you know, when we're looking at like smaller organizations or ensembles or whatever, we're thinking, well, it's a benefit to you to come work with us, you know, but actually, no, it's the opposite. And that should be it. payment enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, you should be good now, like, you know, yeah. but but actually it's, you know, you can't eat, can't eat off of that. And so, so I think, you know, ultimately it's just thinking about, you know, how, how we're actually like, you know, creating a system where, you know, this work is sustained through money, through time, through energy, um, I think is, is incredibly important. And then once that happens, you know, I think, again, going back to what I'm saying, like, you know, bringing folks along that journey. So, you know, our board members need to begin to see it. The funders need to be able to see that, you know, and I think, you know, it's, it's something, you know, that we're telling a different story based on work that we are doing and not just as a result of whoever is telling us to do that work. And so yeah. that's kind of how I'm kind of visioning like this sort of large scale you know, work. I'll just say, actually to answer your question directly, um, that I, I don't think that I have a, I mean, yes, I do have idea, ideas, but kind of similar to what Jess was saying, like, I feel like the things that I do and I produce really does come from a community. It's not, it's not informed by me alone. And I feel like when that, when the community is actually able to kind of advance the work, um, you know, I think that's when it's the most effective. I, I don't think that I personally will have all the ideas to make the work um, successful. Yeah. There's no I in team, as they say. As they say. As they say. And I think that when you, not only yourself as a leader of the organization, but it's not only you, but who you surround yourself by and who are yeah. actually giving those. I mean, my board now um, has, you know, not just black people on it, it as like white people, it has Asian person on it. It's like only a very small board, but we're very well represented because you have a different perspective and also a different perspective of what they think the whole idea is. You know what I mean? Even if it's something centric to like a very, you know, black or Latinx type of community, they're like, but have you thought of this? Or I've heard of that. Or, oh, and so it brings it to the table. So I think this idea of diversity is more, even more diverse than we actually think it is. Yeah. Um, you know, as a Gary, Gary was saying, by the way, just touching back on what he just said, it was very interesting what you said about compensation and, um, and things like that. Um, just an experience, I have a friend who I, who joined um, a discussion group of basically um, about diversifying or making more diverse an arts program that included music and things like that. And she showed up to the meeting and uh, she was the only person of color and the only woman in the entire meeting. Come to find out about it, she knew a lot of other people there that they were all getting paid a stipend 
except for her. And she was the only one there of coming from the background of diversity. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she found out that she was the only one not being paid <clears throat> a stipend that day. And, and halfway through the meeting, after she realized it, she said, I just don't feel comfortable being here because obviously they're in a position that they want to take all of her ideas, yeah. but of course, give her nothing for it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and, that, and I think that that's something that, you know, Gary, as you were saying, something that's really important because then you feel like you're undervalued or you just, your, your ideas or your thoughts are actually being, um, I, I didn't want to say uh, stolen or, you know, abused. Appropriated. Yeah. Yeah. You want to use a, a really that's bad word, you know, and but that's what she felt like. And they tried to get her back and say, no, 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 no. But they had already cast the die by not yeah. treating them equal in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a very interesting comment in the chat uh, for those of you who haven't looked at it uh, from Lillian Snortland about um, a program called Wage, which is a, a effort to make artist payment more transparent and more systematized and um, that, you know, just so that people are being treated fairly. So I uh, thank you, Lillian, for that. And uh, mm -hmm. I will take a look at that. Um, I want to talk about, we, we only have 14 minutes left, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about something that I found on um, Urban Playgrounds website, which I really, I thought was so interesting and so um, thought provoking, which is um, you started as a chamber orchestra. They started as a chamber orchestra that, uh, to play, um, you know, to play contemporary work. And at a certain point, especially in the wake of the brutal murders of George Floyd and all, and, 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 and all of the stories that came to light in the summer of 2020, you pivoted your focus a little bit and said, we are specifically going to play the music of black and women composers. And one of the things on your website, which I found interesting is like um, you said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, the Western European male canon is well taken care of by, mm -hmm. uh, by certain institutions. And we feel that we can do the most good by focusing on this. We, and you said it very respectfully and you didn't say it was an either or, you, you said it as a, you know, yes, we love Mahler and Tchaikovsky and Brahms, but there's more than that and we need to focus on that. I'm interested in all of your opinions because I think it really gets to the dynamic of the title of this session. Hmm. Is it okay for legacy cultural organizations to be our museums are you know our halls of tradition and to keep that alive which we all love but we know there's more there and that for other organizations to take up the torch and push our art form and our field of orchestral music forward or is that not okay does there have and and if it's not okay how do how do those two things kind of live together and with each other right does that make yeah. sense as, a, as, as yeah. a thought? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think for me, it's two part. Uh, one as an administrator and one as a violinist, as a freelancer. And I think the two things can live in one person. Um, but the individual in me says, yes, I love this. But also you've messed up so many times and I'm so tired and I'm so sick of this chess game for what, for institutions that are fiscally unstable and have provided me or my colleagues with no sort of reassurance or insurance or anything beyond, you'll love this symphony. So that's like the individualistic side of me. But as an administrator, I feel like it's my responsibility to kind of think further than that because it is true that we reach more people by reaching the people who love this art form and who love the output. And that's going to be many different types of people. And I think for me, the way that I integrate those two schools of thought into my practice is because I do so much mainstream work. And every time I do some sort of mainstream gig, there's some person in the band or in the production who, to me is a genius who is blown away that we exist and that we're doing this and that they hear string playing that they like and they're like, oh my God, I love this and I didn't know. 
or someone who had didn't know to put together that you love this movie score, you love this Bond score. And so you already love orchestral music. You just don't know that you love it because you haven't been shown this. And so a large part of how I reconcile um, the very true, I to my experience, because I don't have any answers to be honest, but to my experience, it's been true that there is a place for everyone in the game. And if you're thinking about the long game, we are playing a long game. There are immediate things that I want that if they're within my control, I will make happen. But we're also playing a really long game with really long lasting institutions that are rooted in capitalism. So mm -hmm. for us to ignore the fiscal priorities of any given organization is to, to doom that organization. That's just from my experience. So the way that I reconcile these feelings I have about orchestras is to say, hey, look, you want to be relevant. You want to exist. Make everyone understand that they already like you, that they already want you, that there's already a need for you. Um, I just played a week of shows for Ain't Too Proud to Beg, um, the national tour in Charlotte. And it was eight shows and they were solidly sold out to the point that I could not get comps. I could not afford the discount prices for my family. And I was frustrating, but it was also like, okay, people really need this. Like they need entertainment. They need to be sitting in a hall watching something. With happen. people. Yes, yeah. they don't wanna watch another HBO premiere from the living room. Like they actually wanna be in the hall. And yeah. we weren't selling out shows like that before the pandemic. And, you know, it's just working with mainstream artists. I see all the time how there's an immediate need for something. And there's an immediate need for this particular area of the industry or this particular craft or this particular genre. And I think that the way to really get people to accept that there is a lane for everyone in the long game is, for me, the connection to the mainstream and just demonstrating mm -hmm. a straight up fiscal need to exist within mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And identifying your audience. That's one thing that I think that this whole capitalist thing and these old rooted, who is coming to these concerts and who they're catering to has mm -hmm. totally changed. And, uh, and they don't, you know, they just, you know, they'll dismiss a certain group of people like, oh, they're not interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, the Metropolitan Opera has shown us over the last season with their whole new production of Porgy and Bess and also then, of course, they, they have the Terrence Blanchard and things like that, that, yeah, Black people like opera too. <laughs> you know, they had they started with a couple of productions and they decided to go full hog, get a whole new chorus in and show this whole new, and, and the Met has been known for the, their diversity in the orchestra, so they've been really good in my book in general. But once mm -hmm. they did that, uh, they they saw that the people came out the woodworks to actually see it. And these were diverse people. And it's like, it was so good to them. And I know that they had some problems that they started to like rebook it several times afterwards just to jump on the money train again. Um, and I thought, that, and and I've been, went, went to the receptions and everything like that and who they were catering to at the reception was very telling that they were very sensitive to that. There was a whole new market that they hadn't even thought of discovering, but now they've discovered it. Now it's like, you know, once you go black, you never come back. There's a new Terrence Allen <laughs> on the market. There's Malcolm X being played there because they can see that, you know, we love Traviata, we love all those things, but there's a whole market of people who would actually come and see something that was more suitable for them or more, you know, um, in their lives or things that they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. I also, I'll just, oh, I'm oh, so sorry, Gary. No, sorry, I, I'm not sure if I'm freezing. I'm like, everyone's frozen to me right now, but um, I'll just quickly, just two things. One, one to respond to what you had said, Ed, in terms of like, should big institutions kind of remain the museums, which I, I don't think we can. I don't think we have the opportunity to be a museum. I don't even think museums have the opportunity to be, to be museums. I mean, even they are trying to evolve you know, during right. this time. So, um, so I, I think, you know, but I do feel like we should become more like learning organizations. So looking at the work that Jess is doing, looking at what Marlon is doing, you know, I think, I think that's the, the, the difference that, that should be happening. 
Um, I will say that it also, there's also like a thin line or balance, especially being a predominantly white institution between like actually doing the work and being performative around the work and not trying to exploit just to, to, to attract people, but really because you, you believe strongly in the vision to do that work. Because I think, you know, yes, and I, I agree with what Marlon was saying around like, you know, you can see, you know, black folks like opera, they like the orchestra, whatever, but I don't want to just see black folks once or twice in the season. It yeah. should be around the entire, you know, whenever they choose to. And, yeah, and, and that is so true right now for the Asian American community. It's like right. enough with the Lunar New Year concert. It's like, yeah, we're please. done. <laughs> yeah. Please. Yeah. There, are other, yeah, Look, so there like, are other places you can put up. Yeah, what I think yeah. is also, it's a bridge. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a bridge. They get to see these performers and they see, get to see these performers doing things they, you know, for instance, Angel Blue, then she, or Pretty Yinde, now she's Traviata. She was in yeah. one of the productions and now they've moved over. So they're taking those people like, well, I loved Angel Blue in that. Well, if you loved her in that, how about love her in Traviata next season? <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? And I and I really <laughs> love Marlon also, you know, it's funny that we're praising the Metropolitan Opera, which takes more pot shots than any arts organization on the planet, probably, but they really used many of the cast members of Fire Shut Up in My Bones in other productions throughout exactly. the fall, which was fabulous to see, you know? That's and so they learned. Y'all, we have four minutes left, okay? So I'm gonna start, but I want each of you to just like in one minute or less, say the takeaway that you most want people who are listening today to take away about you know, how innovation can thrive in orchestral institutions, you know, and I'll start by saying, um, and Jess, I think I'm kind of stealing yours, so forgive me, um, that creating space to fail constructively is a really big deal, especially for administrators and leaders of color. I think thinking about how to make that happen and make it safe for that to happen, I had never quite thought of it that way. So I think that's like, if any of you, are thinking about how to change the orchestra world. It's like, how do you create safe space to try things and maybe fail? Like, I love that. Yeah. Gary, what about you? Um, shoot, I was like, who's next? Um, I think, I think uh -huh. for me, um, I'll, I'll say that, um, that you are not the only person in a room. Um, and I think the more we can sort of think broadly um, and, and think that we're all like, if, if just, if Jess doesn't succeed with her work, I'm not succeeding with my work. If Marla's not succeeding, I'm not succeeding. And so I think the more we can look at our work collectively, um, I think the better our field will be, um, the better our communities will be, the, the more enriching our art will be. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that this conversation actually uh, reinforces the importance of collaboration and community and affirmation, especially yeah. for you know mar historically marginalized communities. Yeah. I, I just to rephrase what you said briefly, I think, you know, it's not a competition, like we got to help each other, <laughs> right, yeah. in our innovation, right? Yeah. Marlon, um, what about you? All about support and opportunity. Without the support and opportunity, we cannot grow. You need that. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, you know, all of this leads to having the support to actually enrich our society, having the support to actually make these um, mistakes or you know, things that make you grow, but with, you know, without that support, you cannot grow. So I yeah. think that's one of my main, main points. Yeah. So we're going to have to build systems of support for innovation and for change, as opposed to just hoping that it happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Jess, you get the last word. <laughs> um, I, I just think that um, it's so funny because, you know, the new Sex in the City reboot, I'm gonna yeah. it. I'm gonna do it. There's a You're gonna go there. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. There's a line um that Miranda says to Carrie where she's like, they're working on a housing project, like a painting yep. pro a community engagement project. And she says, and Carrie's like, I just this isn't my thing. And she said, like, I'll just write a check. And she says, You can't just be the white lady who writes a check anymore. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. Um, and so my biggest thing is if you are someone with access to assertively go to that organization and say, 
how can I help? Accept criticism, be open to criticism. Um, I also feel very strongly that in an era where the individual holds such priority, it is that much more important for us to understand that none of this will happen without a strong sense of community. So it's basically yeah. just adding on to what Thierry is already saying. There is a place for everyone. Yes. Thank you all. We're out of time. I think you all are amazing and magnificent and doing incredible work. And I'm so glad to know all of you. Um, thank you all for listening. And uh, that is the end of this session. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.